Good morning, Sabbath School. Um, this morning we have another special uh, event. We've been going through Understanding Creation. We'll probably go through that uh, for a bit more. But uh, this morning you get to listen to an original author instead of me trying to explain what the original author really meant. Um, and uh, our subject today is on plate tectonics. And uh, we're privileged to have Dr. Ben Clausen. And uh, just uh, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, Ben Clausen is, had an MS in geology from here and a PhD in physics from the University of Colorado. He's in nuclear physics. And uh, he's had uh, what, several dozen publications now. And um, uh, uh, he's been working on Southern California granitic rocks, and uh, um, some of which is directly related to plate tectonics. And uh, in addition, he is a member of the uh, Geoscience Research Institute. It's been since, what, 1990? And uh, he's uh, been uh, one of those who has been organizing uh, churches, science and religion uh, meetings of various kinds. First Briscoe and now, uh, was it Greco now? Whatever it is. And uh, so uh, uh, he's. Uh, an old friend of the creation evolution um, controversy. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I am very privileged to have uh, Ben uh, present his chapter in uh, the book Understanding Creation. And at this time, I will turn the uh, uh, time over to Dr. Clausen. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Let's pray to start this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful that you are our creator. We're thankful that we can study about your creation this morning. Please bless us as we think about this world that you've made for us to appreciate. In Christ's name, amen. This little animation doesn't fit very nicely in the middle of a PowerPoint, so I'm going to put it at the beginning, uh, and it will give you a little bit of a preview of some of the stuff we're looking at. Yeah, that's probably a little better. Uh, so this is what the present day continental configuration looks like, but if we move back, you notice how the continents move around. And there's a couple things you'll notice here. One is how the old world and the new world fit together nicely. So the big bulge in Africa fits in between North and South America. So you have a pretty good fit there. Um, there's all kinds of things you can notice here. We won't look at all of them. But one thing you can notice is that in the past, uh, this animation shows India being down in between Africa and the Antarctic and Australia. And then at one point it comes whizzing up and it hits Asia. And so you know what happens when India hits Asia, you get the Himalayas. And you're still getting that effect, so there's still plenty of earthquakes there in that area. And supposedly the Himalayas are still rising a little bit. Uh, so that's one feature you notice is India. Another you can notice is the Hawaiian Islands. You have the Emperor Seamounts, and then there's kind of a dog leg there, and then you get the Hawaiian Islands. So you can see that they kind of pop up all in a row there. So there's the Emperor Seamounts, and then there's the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and the last Hawaiian Island is still active, and I guess there's another one that's another volcano that's starting underwater there, according to what I understand. Um, 
as I go around to various places, I emphasize different features, but that's probably enough for now unless you have some specific ones you want to look at. The Caribbean is fairly interesting. There's a little Caribbean plate. Um, Saudi Arabia used to be part of Africa, and then it kind of splits off right about there, and you have the Red Sea that separates Saudi Arabia and Africa. Uh, so there's all kinds of features you, that this helps you picture what, ha what happens as the plates move around. So then we will um, go to the PowerPoint and see what we can do to talk about it. Okay, so that's another picture of the same one we just had. Okay, basically I'm following the same uh, outline here in the PowerPoint presentation as the chapter in the book. First of all, we'll look at some of the basics of plate tectonics. Um, the Earth's internal structure. What are the major plates and also some of the minor plates? The interesting things happen at the plate edges, so we'll talk a little bit about what happens at the plate edges. Uh, you also get some interesting stuff in plate interiors. Most is at the edges, but we'll briefly mention what happens in the interiors. Uh, then we'll go on to some of the details about plate tectonics. Um, how is it related to the Bible? What are some of the alternative models rather than the standard model? And a few conclusions at the end. So that's kind of the direction that we're going in the discussion this morning. The Earth's inter internal structure, uh, a core, the mantle is the major part of the Earth, and then a little bit of a crust here on the surface. The crust is um, basically what uh, makes up the plates that are moving around, um, and they're moving around on this mantle in the interior. So how do we know what the Earth is made up of? Mainly it's from seismic waves. So if there's an earthquake in one place and you get the um, seismic waves from that earthquake moving through the earth, they're picked up um, at receiver stations all over the earth and based on the length of time and what kind of waves you get at all of these, um, you can figure out, you can tell a lot about what the internal structure of the earth is like. In addition, uh, the, in the standard model, the Earth's magnetic field is due to um, motion inside the core. I have several slides on the Earth's magnetic field, but I don't think we're going to have enough time to talk about um, paleomagnetism as well as plate tectonics, so I'll probably skip those. Uh, the major plates, most of them correspond to the various continents, North American plate, South American plate, Eurasian, African, um, Antarctic plate, and the Australian plate. In addition, there is one that's an oceanic plate. Here's the Pacific plate here. Uh, and besides that, there's a lot of minor plates. And so you have the Indian plate that we saw moving up to hit Eurasia, the Arabian plate. Here's the Caribbean plate that has moved in between North and South America, uh, the little Nazca plate, and then what used to be the Farallon plate that went underneath North America but eventually um, part of it, part of the spreading center was subducted, so you end up with the Juan de Fuca plate and the Cocos plate that are left of that. Uh, very important for us here in, in Southern California, what happened and um, how does this affect uh, the San Andreas Fault and all of the granites that we get here in Southern California as well as in the Sierras. All the interesting stuff, or almost all the interesting stuff, happens at plate boundaries. Um, and where you have two boundaries, you can have three things happening. Either the plates are moving apart, they're moving together, or they're moving past each other. In each one, you get some unique things happening. So you have divergent, convergent, and transform. So here you can see the transform fault where um, the spreading centers are being uh, offset. 
Um, spreading centers here, we'll have some pictures of those. And then subduction, where plates are moving together. Okay, the first one we'll talk about is where the plates are moving apart. Uh, you may get some kind of an upwelling, then a rift valley. Eventually, if it continues, it fills in with the ocean. You have some kind of an ocean filling it, like the Red Sea. And then eventually, you have a mid-ocean ridge. So an example of the mid-ocean ridge is right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a spreading center. Um, if the old world and the new world used to be together and then separated, this would be the point, uh, the spreading center where they're moving apart from each other. Uh, one example, um, up here close to Iceland, Iceland is right on this spreading center and just south of Iceland, a volcano came up right on this spreading center back in 1963, the island of Surtsey. Maybe you've heard about the island of Surtsey as a pretty recent island that just appeared. Um, in addition to the spreading centers in the ocean, you also have, in this case, what's called a failed rift. Apparently, uh, the, the theory is that uh, part of Africa started to spread, but it didn't continue. So up here you have the Red Sea that's a spreading center between Africa and Saudi Arabia. But this spreading continued down along the Rift Valley in Ethiopia and Kenya, Tanzania, and so forth. Um, down into the Malawi area. So you have a spreading center here, but it's, um, it hasn't continued, at least it hasn't continued enough so that it's opened up and let the ocean in there. So you have a picture like this in Kenya. Um, if you drive from Nairobi west to the western part of Kenya, you drive down one side of this escarpment into the Rift Valley, and then you drive up the other side. If you don't know what you're looking for, it may be a little bit difficult to see it. But if you know where the rift starts and ends, um, you have a pretty good idea you're going down into a valley that's pretty flat and then up the other side. And here's a picture from an airplane, the escarpment here and the valley here. Second, where you have two plates going together, um, if one is an oceanic plate, it's more dense. It's made out of basalt. It gets subducted under the less dense continental plate. And in the process of being subducted, it carries water down. This lowers the melting point of the mantle wedge here. And the magmas that are formed, the um, lowered melting point means that the, ma the mantle can um, turn to a liquid. And the less dense liquid moves up into the crust uh, and either stops in the crust and makes um, large granitic type plutons, large granitic bodies, or it can come out at the surface and make volcanoes. Uh, the, <coughs> the Sierra Nevadas are one example. Also the granites here in Southern California, Mount San Jacinto, down into Baja, California. It's called the Peninsula Ranges Batholith because it goes down into the Baja Peninsula. Um, also the Andes, this cordillera goes all the way from Alaska down to the Tierra del Fuego in Chile. And so you have um, either the Farallon Plate or the Nazca Plate that's being subducted underneath North and South America, and it forms that entire range of, of mountains, North America and South America. Uh, here's one example, one piece here, the Juan de Fuca Plate being subducted underneath uh, Northwestern United States, um, gives us the string of volcanoes here, the, the Cascade Volcanoes. Um, in other areas, you can have an oceanic plate going underneath another oceanic plate. Uh, examples of that would be the Aleutian Islands that are formed. One plate goes under the other. You have volcanoes here. The Aleutian Islands are one string of volcanoes. Japan would be an example of another one. So again, convergent, where two plates are coming together, but one oceanic plate goes under another oceanic plate. Um, also convergent, in this case, two continents coming together. Uh, here you have an example of India, the subcontinent of India, the, the microplate um, or, or the small plate going up hitting Asia. So here's India, uh, part of the oceanic lithosphere is being subducted here. But then when India hits Asia, uh, you get the Himalayas formed um, at the suture. The third kind of boundary is where two plates are moving past each other. And in this case, you have the Cocos Plate, the Juan de Fuca Plate, 
And between them, you have a transform fault where the two are moving past. The Pacific plate is moving past the North American plate. And as a result, we get our earthquakes here in Southern California. And as I tell people, I'm a real smart geologist who bought a house about a mile away from the San Andreas Fault. So go figure. Um, I think probably there's not too many places in Southern California where you can buy a house that isn't fairly close to either the San Andreas or one of the many um, other faults that are related to the San Andreas Fault. And so this is the kind of thing you get. I think this picture is from the Imperial Valley where you have a bunch of orange trees all lined up in a row and then it moved a little bit and so you get the uh, effect of the offset of the trees there. And that's what happens when it moves. This was 1994 um, in Northridge. And this is one of those interstates up there that fell down. And if I remember correctly, I happened to be over at Newbold at the time, and I was just getting ready to give a lecture on plate tectonics when they said, well, there is just a earthquake there in Southern California. OK, so that's the three boundaries. But then in addition, you do have some interesting stuff happening in plate interiors. And according to the plate tectonic model, you have hot spots. You have magma that comes up from the uh, mantle. And this is supposed to be stationary. And then the crust, in this case the Pacific plate, the oceanic crust, moves over this hot spot. And as it moves, you get a whole string of volcanoes that have popped up here. And so when they've done the radiometric dates on them, um, the ones that are further away are older. And then as you get closer here, they're younger and younger until the active one that's there now. You get the same thing under the continents as well. And the example here is Yellowstone. Here's Idaho. If you've been up here, you may be familiar with all the basalt, black basalt, craters of the moon, and so forth. And again, from the dates here, these are older and they get younger and younger until under Yellowstone um, you still have plenty of current thermal activity under Yellowstone. So two examples of um, plate interiors, mantle plumes that are um, causing volcanism in the interior of plates, not just at the edge. Okay, so that's some of the basics. Next what we will look at is a few of the details. What is some of the evidence that's used in support of the current theory of plate tectonics? What causes it? What's the current understanding of what causes the plates to move? And an interesting one, plate tectonics is the basic idea behind why do we even have continents? Where did the continents come from to begin with? And there's a whole discussion about that, but I think I have maybe one or two slides on that one. OK, so first of all, we'll look at some of the evidence. Um, one of the pieces of evidence is the ring of fire, all the earthquakes and volcanoes around the Pacific and in plenty of other parts around the world as well. Uh, but the earthquakes along North America, the volcanoes here, the Aleutian Islands, plenty of volcanoes and earthquakes along the edge of, the, uh, of Asia, um, down into the South Pacific and so forth. Another piece of evidence is direct measurement uh, using GPS. And there's direct evidence that the plates are moving. And whenever you have an earthquake, I guess that's enough evidence all by itself. Uh, another piece of evidence that is used is similarities of fossils between continents. Similar fossils in Africa and South America. Um, here's one mesosaur that is southern South America and also in South Africa. Uh, Glossopteris is found in a lot of them, South America, Africa, India, the Antarctic, and Australia, and so forth. So similarities when all of these continents were together in the past. Another piece of evidence that's used is uh, matching geology. The Appalachians in North America and the Caledonian Mountains in Scandinavia um, are suggested to line up nicely when the Old World and New World were next to each other in the past. Another piece of evidence is ages of the ocean floor. Um, as you get further and further away from the spreading center here, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here, um, the ridge here in the Pacific, also in the Indian Ocean, as you get further and further away from them, 
the dates become older and older. And so here you can, you can see the picture here, or the um, legend here of the older ages as you get further away. Uh, actually, this piece of evidence was probably one of the strongest ones back in the 1960s that led people uh, to the revolution in thinking about how the Earth formed. These paleomagnetic strips, it seems you have normal and reverse polarity. And I'm not going to go into the details. It takes a little while to describe this, and I don't think we have enough time to go into the details. But if in the question and answer, if you have questions, we can talk some more about it. And apparent polar wander. Six and seven are both re related to the Earth's magnetic field. So if you're interested in that, we can come back and talk about that later. What causes the plates to move? Well, there's various suggestions. Maybe it's magma that comes up at the spreading centers and pushes the plates apart. That's one option. Another option is that maybe once the plates cool down, uh, they become more dense, they get heavier, and so then they're pulled back into the mantle. Push, pull, or a third option is convection. Like when you have a pot of water on the stove and it heats up, um, if the center is the hottest, the hot water will move up. Maybe it's a little cooler around the edges and it'll move back down, and so you'll get convection currents in the water inside, um, inside your pot. Um, they suggest maybe you have the same thing inside the earth, that in some areas it gets hot, it moves up, in other areas it's cooler, it moves back down. So as the mantle, as you have circulating magma currents in the mantle, it carries the um, crust, the plates uh, up in the crust along with it. Probably the actual mechanism is a combination of those. Push, pull, and carry. Okay, this one probably takes a whole talk by itself, um, but according to standard theory, uh, the Earth started out by the accretion of material from the solar system, and it was fairly uniform. Uh, but it was also hot. And with time, it heated up enough that the interior of the Earth uh, became liquid, and you started having these convection currents. And this uniform Earth uh, started not being so uniform because the heavier material sunk to the middle and made the core. The lighter material went up to the surface foreign volcanoes, and that's how plate tectonics started. So several years ago, I went to a granite conference in South Africa, and along with that, they had several field trips. One of them was to eastern uh, South Africa, east of Johannesburg, in the Barberton Granite Greenstone Complex. These are some pictures of it. I'm not expecting you to figure out all the details here. Uh, but according to their understanding, this probably was one of the first examples of plate tectonics on Earth started between, in the standard model, between about 3.5 and 3, 3.1 billion years ago. Um, so you have the beginning of volcanics, um, uh, little plates that um, accreted, and uh, the melanges, the pillow basalts, and so forth that you find today as well. Uh, so gradually you had differentiation, separation of the heavier stuff into the mantle, lighter stuff that started making the continents, granites instead of basalts, which are heavier. And over time, you had more and more of this differentiation, and this is how the continents were formed in the standard, in the standard model. Um, this is a very complex diagram. When I teach igneous and metamorphic petrology, we spend a day or two going over um, what happens at these subduction zones to make the granites underground as well as the volcanics that come up, um, you have what they call a subduction factory. So the slabs get subducted, and according to current theory, pieces of these go down to the bottom of the mantle, and then they eventually uh, get recycled up to the top at hot spots. And so like in Hawaii, you get some of the recycled material. Um, but this is the standard model of what happens at subduction zones today, how you are continually making the continents larger and larger, and what happened back in the Precambrian, the early Earth, how the continents were formed to begin with. Okay, so that's the standard model. Okay, now, looking at some of the issues related to the Bible. 
Uh, first of all, it's interesting to see how plate tectonics has affected and developed what we see of the uh, Middle East, of Israel, the Holy Land area. So I'll give a couple, uh, several slides on that. The Bible has a fair amount to say about earthquakes and volcanoes. I'll give some references to that. Notice these earthquakes and volcanoes, most of them are at plate boundaries, and there's plate boundaries in, in the Mediterranean. Um, it seems like whenever the plates move, you get catastrophes. So there's plenty of examples of catastrophes, and all of these are directly related to uh, plate tectonics, or a lot of them are. And interestingly, it was actually some theologians who first suggested the idea that the continents were moving. So I have a couple slides talking about that. So these were the basics of plate tectonics, and now how is it related to the Bible picture? And what does it have to say uh, about what we understand about Bible times? Okay, we already talked about the Red Sea, a spreading center between Africa and Saudi Arabia. This spreading center also moves up along the um, Dead Sea, the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, and so forth, up to Mount Lebanon, and then eventually on up into Turkey. Um, so the geography of the Holy Land is directly related to plate tectonics, and I have another picture with a little bit more detail in this area. Um, there are basalts up in Galilee and over into Jordan uh, that have formed right along this um, fault and because of the fault down in uh, southern Sinai Peninsula you have Precambrian rocks, Mount Sinai is, a, is Precambrian and then we'll also talk a little bit about a few pieces over here in the Mediterranean, the Isle of Patmos as well as the catacombs in, in Italy. Okay, so here's a little bit more detailed map of Israel. You can see the Gulf of Aqaba here. Um, African and um, Saudi Arabian plate are moving apart. And then along this transform fault, you have movement. Now, in, and as it turns out, this is just like what we have in Southern California. If you have these two moving and they're offset a little bit, if they move apart, it will make a little hole there. And that hole is where the Dead Sea is. And the Dead Sea is 400 meters below sea level, I think, something like that, which is the same as Salton Sea just south of us here. On the San Andreas Fault, it got pulled apart. And you have the Salton Sea, which is, what, a couple hundred feet below sea level, something like that. So you have a pull-apart basin in some areas. Now, in other areas uh, where it's moving, they can get caught on a little edge there. And so as they get caught, that piece moves up. That's what happens here in Southern California. You have the San Andreas Fault, or at least part of it, going through uh, San Gorgonio Pass. On one side, San Jacinto has been moved up. On the other side, you have San Gorgonio that's moved up. So there's a big bend in the San Andreas Fault, and you get those two um, mountains that have been pushed up. And you have the same thing here in um, in Israel and Jordan. You have a pull-apart basin here that makes the Dead Sea, and you have another bend here that makes Mount Hermon um, up at the north end of Israel and into Lebanon. Okay, so here's some of the pictures here. This is um, Capernaum, plenty of basalt up there. The, um, the Mount of Beatitudes where Jesus was supposed to have given the Sermon on the Mount is mostly basalt. If you go down to Mount Sinai, it's Precambrian granite. Uh, just some examples of the geology there. And here you have uh, the African plate and the Eurasian plate uh, moving toward each other. Um, this is a really complicated area. Uh, but in one area, you have uh, the volcanic, uh, the, the, the series of volcanoes here in Italy. Also in Patmos, you have a subduction zone here. And so you have. Um, the Isle of Patmos that's right around in here um, that's due to the subduction. So here, here's the Isle of Patmos. Um, a few years ago, um, one of the theology professors, seminary professors at Andrews said, well, here is a quotation from the book Acts of the Apostles that talks about John the, um, John the Revelator on Patmos. He was looking at the um, rocks there on Patmos, and it was evidence for the flood. And so he wanted me to look at the geology there and see how it was related to the flood. Um, here's a picture 
Um, I think this is fairly close to where John was supposed to have been in a cave, uh, looking down at the Mediterranean here. Most of this is volcanics. Um, it's upper, upper Cenozoic, so it's pretty much at the top of the geologic column. Um, so, depending on how you interpret this, um, you could say as a result of the worldwide floods, you had volcanism and plate tectonics, and Patmos would be one example of that. Um, you get the same kind of thing in Italy, lots of volcanics there, Vesuvius um, and Pompeii, Etna, and so forth, but also right around Rome. The catacombs there in Rome are made out of volcanic tuff, which is fairly soft and fairly easy to excavate through. So it was pretty easy to dig these um, tunnels and have places to bury the dead there. Plenty of Bible references to earthquakes in the days of Uzziah. Uh, plenty of specific events, Korah and company, Jonathan's attack on the garrison in Gibeah, Elijah on Horeb at Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection when Paul was in the prison at Philippi, and then there's more general references, prophecies, and so forth. Similarly with um, volcanoes, not quite as specific, these are more general, when God causes the mountains to burn or melt or flow or smoke, it seems like it's probably referring to some kind of volcanic activity. Similarly, in the future, the elements will melt with fervent heat, a lake of fire for judgment. And then in some places where you have both earthquakes and volcanoes, maybe, or some kind of burning, when God came down on Mount Sinai, it both quaked and burned. And there's both earthquakes and volcanoes at God's presence. I'm not sure how you put all the pieces together between what God does and what happens with the plate tectonics, but I think it would be a useful thing to, to develop that a little bit. Okay, then I'll give you some examples of catastrophes, plenty of examples of catastrophes related to plate tectonics, uh, both volcanoes and earthquakes. Vesuvius, this is an artist's picture. Uh, this is Pompeii looking at Vesuvius, and these are the results um, people fleeing away from Vesuvius, they were in Pompeii, got covered up, um, then they decayed and so there were left just um, cavities there. When they came back to ex excavate Pompeii, they found these cavities and what they did apparently was fill them with plaster of Paris of some kind and then they take away the ash. And so these are plaster of Paris um, casts, I guess it would be, plaster of Paris casts of where these people had been. The Lisbon earthquake, a uh, pretty famous one, 1755, magnitude 8.7, uh, which is pretty big. That's almost as big as the Japan one um, uh, earlier this year. A tsunami, five to 10 meters high, 60,000 people died, and it was only a few years after that that Voltaire wrote his book Candide, partly in response to the Lisbon earthquake. And why do we live on an earth where you get all these bad things happening? More recently, you have Mount St. Helens, uh, that is where the Juan de Fuca plate is being subducted underneath North America. Uh, 2004, the Banda Aceh um, earthquake, and that didn't kill nearly as many people as the tsunami. Um, I think now they're estimating more like 250,000 people died, uh, 9.1 magnitude. And in this case, you had the India plate moving underneath the Sunda plate. So here you have this area here. Here's India. So you have the Indian plate moved that way. Um, and as it moved, it pushed up the oceanic floor. And as it pushed it up, it also pushed up the water. And that's where you got the tsunami from. Um, last year, the Haiti earthquake. Uh, here you have the Caribbean plate that is moving by the North American plate. This is a transform fault. They're moving <coughs> past each other instead of one under another. And so here you had the transform fault causing this 7.0 seven, uh, uh, 7 magnitude earthquake. Quite a bit less, but a lot of it depends on how the buildings are built, whether there's some kind of code for how well they're built. And I think in Haiti, that was probably as much of a problem as anything as how the, how the buildings were built. Also, the Chile earthquake, um, close to the same time. And then this year, the earthquake in Japan. In this case, you had, well, in general, I guess you could say the Pacific plate moving underneath the Asian plate. It wasn't quite that simple. 
but recently I read one where it said, I think on average, um, the upper plate was pushed up maybe 10 to 20 meters, and in some place more like 50 to 60 meters. It was pushed up quite a lot, and as the ocean um, crust itself was pushed up, it pushed up the water, and that's the reason you got this big tsunami coming in and, of course, the breaking up of the roads. Okay, so I think here is a diagram of it. Um, there's a lot of little plates here in between the Asian plate and the Pacific plate. Um, so here they have the earthquake center, and here's a little diagram of how um, as, the, uh, as, as there was slip on the subducting plate, it pushed up the ocean floor, and that gives you the tsunami that wiped out um, a lot of the coastal area along Japan. Okay, then uh, two slides here about how theologians actually suggested the idea of plate tectonics. Uh, 1668, the French cleric and theologian Plassey, I guess would be the way you say it, um, he said, before the deluge, America was not separated from the other parts of the earth, before the flood, and there were no islands. Then the German theologian in the 1700s suggested continental drift based on 1 Chronicles 119, which is basically the same as Genesis 20, 10 and 25, says, for in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. So his interpretation was that this was a physical division of the lands. Uh, this probably doesn't fit very well in with the flood model. If you had a flood model, you'd say, um, probably you had the plate tectonics during the flood whereas this is in the genealogies between Noah and Abraham, so this would be after the flood. So it wouldn't fit very well into that picture, uh, but he, he suggested it based on that. And then more recently, I don't believe this person was a theologian, uh, but he did accept the idea of Noah's flood and said that the old world and new world separated at the time of the deluge. Um, in, and he talked about this back in the 1800s. Okay, some models for how to deal with it. First of all, notice that it's a scientific revolution. Second, can you get rapid rates for it? We'll talk a little bit about John Baumgartner's model. Uh, third, we'll talk about some of the issues for it. How do you understand these issues? Fourth, what are some alternative theories besides Baumgartner's model? So first of all, notice that the idea of plate tectonics was pretty much laughed at back in the 1920s when Alfred Wegener came up with it. Um, and his model was a little bit different. It was, um, uh, his suggestion was the continents were plowing through the oceans and he didn't really have a mechanism to explain how it could happen. So people didn't really accept it. Modern plate tectonics looks at it a little bit differently, but it accepts a lot of the data that, that Wegener used. So an emphasis here is change in paradigms, a major change in paradigm about um, how the Earth formed. Okay, second, how fast uh, are they moving? Um, so I put in a couple cartoons here. Um, this one says, I wouldn't worry. With continental drift, Africa or South America should come by eventually. So I guess these are two guys that are marooned out on a um, Pacific island, and they hope eventually they'll get rescued because one of the continents will come by. Uh, and here's another one. Um, about the U.S. Postal Service, which would be faster, parcel post or waiting until the continents drift together again? So, how fast do they move? Okay, in general, uh, this is in millimeters per year. In the Atlantic, it's maybe 20, 30 millimeters per year, something like that. Um, in the Pacific, you have it moving a little bit faster, maybe up to 100, 150 millimeters per year, something like that. It's kind of on the order of how fast your fingernails grow. Um, it's that order of magnitude. Okay, so at that rate, it would take about 200 million years to separate the old and the new world. So that's the, that gives you kind of the framework. At the current rates, it would take that long, and that's about the estimate, estimated time uh, for when the Atlantic Ocean uh, opened up. Okay, so that's the standard rates. Now, John Baumgartner is a geophysicist who got his degree at UCLA um, in geophysics uh, back in the 
probably about 1980 or something like that, somewhere around there. He worked at Los Alamos for a while. And um, while he was there, he developed a very nice model of plate tectonics. And apparently, it's used within the standard community. Uh, then, I guess on his free time, he said, well, let's see what happens if we put in some different parameters to speed it up. Can we get it to happen in a year instead of 100 million years? So this was his computational mess, uh, mesh as he set it up um, on a Cray computer there. Um, and so he developed his um, idea of catastrophic plate tectonics. Runaway subduction, that yes, you have subduction of the plates, one under another, uh, but as they moved, um, you had a positive feedback cycle so that it heated up the Earth, and the more the Earth was heated up, the faster the plates moved, and the faster the plates moved, the more it heated up the Earth, and so forth, and so it went faster and faster. Um, and so you had very rapid motion. Um, along with that, you had rapid reversals of the Earth's magnetic field. You had plenty of volcanics. Um, steam jettisoned into the atmosphere. You had global rain. And as a result, the ocean floors were raised and water moved onto the continents. So that's kind of the fundamentals of, of John Baumgartner's catastrophic plate tectonics ideas. Um, this has been reported in various places. This one happens to be in US News and World Report in June 1987, I think is what it says there. Um, U.S. News and Re World Report says, the geophysics of God, a scientist embraces plate tectonics and Noah's flood. So here's John Baumgartner. Uh, one of the quotations from here, it says, there is universal agreement that Terra, that's the name of the software, um, created to prove the Bible literally true, is one of the most useful and powerful geological tools in existence. And there's one or two quotes in here from geophysicists who say, yeah, his software is great. We use it, and it's very helpful. They disagree with putting in the fast rates, but they think that he has done a good job of writing the software. OK, so his model of the moving very fast, how does it work? Is it helpful? Are there some problems with it? We're going to skip through this first one. That's about magnetism. We can come back and talk about it later if you want. Um, one of the problems is he has plate tectonics starting in the Mesozoic. Now, I suppose you could extend it back into the Paleozoic and maybe the Precambrian. But there's a couple issues. One is uh, these Wilson cycles that the continents seem to move back and forth. You have, um, in the Atlantic anyway, you have um, an ocean. It's shut. Then another ocean. Uh, let's see. You have a supercontinent that opened. Then it closed again. And then you get the present um, ocean in between. And so you have the continents moving back and forth. It's not just one direction. You might be able to fit that into John Baumgartner's model, uh, but he do hasn't really developed that part. He's mainly just looked at the more recent part. He hasn't tried to extend it. Another part is that you seem to have evidence for plate tectonics, significant evidence in the Precambrian as well, in the formation of the continents. And I don't know whether he has addressed this, but the question is, how were the continents formed? Did God use plate tectonics on the third day of creation? Or if you're comfortable with old Earth young life, was there plate tectonics and volcanoes and earthquakes in the Precambrian before creation? And how do you fit plate tectonics in before sin as well as after sin? And so that's one of the questions. It may not necessarily be a problem, but it's a question that needs to be addressed more. Um, another issue is the temperature and viscosity. How easy it, is it for the crust to move over the mantle? Um, you have quite high viscosities. And to get them to move rapidly, you'd have to decrease the viscosity. And so for the plates to move in a few months, in Baumgartner's model, he has them moving in like two months instead of 200 million years. So that's about nine orders of magnitude faster. You'd have to decrease the viscosity by about nine orders of magnitude. And he has suggested that by increasing the temperature of the mantle by 300 degrees, you might be able to decrease the viscosity by that much and make it possible for them to move that fast. Then um, that, that raises a question, though, about temperature. If you have higher temperatures, you get different kind of rocks. 
Um, instead of your normal basalts, you get chromatidic basalts that have a different composition than normal basalts. And this is one example in South Africa where you have these chromatidites, and you can look at the amount of magnesium and iron. And with higher temperatures, you get different ratios of the materials. So you should be able to determine whether the temperatures were higher in the past than they are today just by looking at the composition of the rocks. Fourth um, is how do you get rid of the heat? If all these ocean floors were magma that has cooled down, where has all the heat from that uh, magma gone? And so Baumgartner himself realizes that is a significant issue, and he says, the flood catastrophe cannot be understood or modeled in terms of time invariant laws of nature. Intervention by God in the natural order during and after the catastrophe appear to be a logical necessity. Manifestations of the intervention appear to include a loss of thermal energy afterwards. So he invokes some, actually nine orders of magnitude that heat was able to escape from the earth a billion times faster than it currently does. And so that's how he gets rid of the heat. Okay, what other theories are there? I need to speed up here. Um, Velikovsky suggested ideas back in the 50s, worlds in collision. Sam Carey talked about an expanding earth. Um, in, in plate tectonics today, you have both going together as well as apart. In Sam Carey's model, you have the earth expanding, and so everything's moving away from everything else. Um, Walter Brown has suggested a hydroplate theory where the plates are moving on some kind of a subterranean water. Um, there was actually a discussion between Michael Ord and John Baumgartner back in 2002 in the Creation Ex Nihilo Technical Journal. Um, John Baumgartner accepted plate tectonics. Michael Ord did not. And so they had a, a discussion back and forth that you can read. Um, and granite formation itself. Granite formation is part of plate tectonic theory. How did the granites and volcanics form? And in the Journal of Creation, Taz Walker has talked a little bit about granite formation, catastrophic in its suddenness. And this I found particularly interesting because it's directly related to the research that I'm doing. And the person that he quotes throughout this article is somebody who regularly comes to the granite conferences I go to. In fact, he was in charge of the granite conference in South Africa that I went to. So a number of interesting comments about can you get granite's formation rapidly in this plate tectonic model. And this is some of the research that I'm working on myself, both here in Southern California as well as in Peru. Um, looking at plate tectonics, how does um, the granites we see here formed by plate tectonics? Isotope dating, the order in the column, crust formation, rates of crust formation, magma mixing. Um, so we're doing a bunch of field work. I'm starting to work with um, a group of people at a at a nearby university on data analysis, computer modeling of heat flow, and so forth. In fact, I've spent a lot of the last two weeks trying to set up software on my computer to do heat flow modeling. So guidelines and working on it. Um, and part of these I have gotten from Randy Yonker. He has an article in archaeology, his guidelines for doing archaeology. Work within mainstream scholarship. Address the big picture more than the details. Um, it's easy to look at this little piece and this little piece, but how do you fit all the pieces together? Work toward a constructive model. It's, it's easy to shoot um, um, darts at somebody else's model and say it's not perfect. It's a little bit harder to come up with your own model that's better. Be cautious with the interpretations and claims, and don't attempt to prove the Bible with science. So Randy Yonker, I've, I've gotten some of that from him. And he said, actually, when he wrote this up, because of that, the people at National Geographic with, were happy with how he did archaeology. So they invited him to come and talk at the National Geographic headquarters about his archaeology research. OK, fi <clears throat> finally, um, what kind of a conclusion do I come up with? I would suggest plate tectonic theory does not fit easily into a short time frame. However, we can trust the details to an all-wise God, for his foolishness is greater than our wisdom. And I would suggest that scientists continue to ask questions, but like Job, fully trust God in the process. And this is, I think this is my last one. So how do I go about dealing with it? Um, first and foremost, a respect for God's word in the church, but a recognition that at times it needs to be reinterpreted. And we have done that over the years, accepting the idea of um, 
continental glaciation or order in the fossil record or something. And recognition, recognition that revelation is limited, not because of God, but because of us. We have our own human limitations in being able to understand um, the inspired word. Nature and science, a great deal of respect for both. But once again, at times, the need to reinterpret uh, and the recognition that nature and science are limited. So how do you relate them? Well, I would suggest that a respect for both of these is important, and only third do you work on trying to put the pieces together. Otherwise, you end up making either a mess out of the theology or a mess out of the science. And uh, it's easy to worry about this stuff, but in Desire of Ages, in a little bit different context, it says God has a thousand ways to do things that we don't know anything about. And finally, um, in the process of doing that, a respect for people. Um, all of this theory has interesting repercussions, but the reason it even makes a difference is what you do with it as you're relating to people. Okay, that's it. And now it's time for questions and comments. Um, I'll raise one real quickly. Um, is there a uh, good explanation why the Big Island of Hawaii is the largest island? Uh, it almost seems like the uh, hot spot must be slowing down as time goes on. That's a good point. That's a couple of them over here. I have three questions for you. First, uh -oh. is there any evidence of some multiple hot spots along that uh, Hawaiian midway chain? The second is uh, there's some evidence of a bulge in North Yellowstone with the uh, animals moving out and the temperature getting warmer and the north part of the lake uh, becoming dry and the south part of the lake uh, starting to flood over. Is that suggesting we might have another caldera there? And third, a little bit more information on these alternating of the uh, magnetic fields in the uh, Atlantic uh, Ridge. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I don't know that in the theory there is more than one hot spot. I think there may be different pieces to it. it. One big hot spot and then it comes up to the surface in different areas. But I think the theory is there's basically one hot spot and the Pacific plate has moved, has moved over it and so you get it younger and younger. But, but yes, when the, when the magma gets close to the surface, I think there's different conduits for it and so it comes up in different places. Um, let's see, your second question was about Yellowstone. And there's quite a discussion about a supervolcano there that maybe at one point the whole thing is going to blow out and you're going to have a major, a major catastrophe there. Because I understand they've got an 11-foot thick ash. An 11-foot thick ash uh, underneath the uh, Great Plains that suggests that there was a huge volcano caldera that uh, deposited 11 feet of ash all across uh, underneath the Great Plains at one time. I think that may, be, that may be right. I don't know the details of that. I know a few years ago we had a Briscoe in, the, in Nebraska, in Lincoln, and some people went up to see um, a state park, I think it was, where a bunch of rhinoceros had been killed. And I think the ash there was supposed to come from Yellowstone, although I don't remember that for sure. It, there, there's, in that general area, I think there's uh, vul volcanism because uh, the entire uh, fossil forest that's been studied. At that that as well, yes, exactly, right, good. Um, and let's see, your third question was about the changes in the magnetic fields yep. going back and forth. Um, that one is still in the process of being developed. I think the standard theory is that you have, well, you get magnetic field by motion of electric charges. And so you can make a magnetic field in a motor by moving the uh, current in there. So the idea is that in the core, in the earth, you have these magnetic charge, separation of charge, and then there's motion of the charge in the core, probably at the core mantle boundary. And so that gives the earth's magnetic field. So they suggest that somehow the motion of charge switches and that changes the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And on average, they think it changes maybe once every 250,000 years or something like that. Although the most recent change was supposed to be 
750,000 years ago, so they figure it's time for another change. Um, but that switching of the field, when you have magma coming up at spreading centers, that liquid rock solidifies, and in it you may have little iron particles, and um, they act like little compasses. And so they kind of align with the Earth's magnetic field and then are frozen in. So you can go back and check the direction of those little pieces of magnet, magnetite in there and figure out what the direction was of the magnetic field in the past. So then you have reversals then. So yeah, good. Uh, I was wondering about the shale formations. Uh, if there's oil gas deep below the surface, if that's a way that these uh, uh, plates could actually move on top of that soft material. OK, could they move? Um, in some places, you have weaker areas in the crust. Uh, they actually, and, and this is a little bit complicated, they, they think that the motion is mainly at the boundary between the lithosphere and asthenosphere, which is not the same as the boundary between the crust and the mantle. You have a physical boundary and you have a chemical boundary and they're not at exactly the same place. So they actually think that the motion is, is deeper than most of your sediments would be. It's probably oh, maybe 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers deep, some 50, some, something like that. Um, and most of your sediments would be much closer to the surface, probably within mm -hmm. a couple of kilometers. So, so it probably would not be related to the, the, the shales and so forth. But you, but you do get motion there on the faults. So you do get related motion there, yeah. Uh. Just a comment uh, about, I think, 40, 50 years ago, I was listening to a professor at UCR uh, in a class in physical geology. And uh, he told us, now there's, yeah, the continents might match, he says, but there was a, name by the, a person by the name of Wagner who uh, tried to uh, suggest that he says, but nobody believes him anymore. Five years later, uh, if you did not believe in plate tectonics, you were excluded from the scientific community. Now, Quite this, a paradigm change. This major paradigm change, it was a sudden one. They don't always go that fast. This one was sudden. And uh, it was intriguing to see how all the new data was fitted, uh, some of the old data just reinterpreted into the new one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was scary because here you had, uh, my professor was of course expressing the, the feeling of the scientific community as a whole there, you know. Uh, this guy is uh, he's really kind of a crackpot, you know. Mm -hmm. And then if you didn't accept it five years later, you were a crackpot. The, the sobering thing was that so much of the scientific community adopted this, uh, and so few of them knew exactly all the details of plate tectonics, which uh, I think illustrates uh, the power of a paradigm and the sociological strength uh, of science uh, as the community moves as a whole from one model to another, which I think needs to put us into a, uh, a little bit of uh, caution about this. Now, I, uh, I admit the, the data for plate tectonics looks fairly impressive. In fact, I happened to be in Atlantic City just at the time that that paper was given that shifted the whole thing. Uh, th those lines you showed there, those parallel lines you showed, which uh, aren't always that good. Yeah, they're not. Uh, just a, uh, a comment uh, or maybe a little caution. Uh, I'm not absolutely convinced that uh, plate tectonics is for sure. Truly the whole scientific community is in it right now and, and uh, uh, we like to work with it. But I also like to think a little bit outside of that box. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I'm really concerned about in plate tectonics is the subduction zones uh, because there are so few, uh, according to some figures, uh, maybe only uh, 
a third of their length. Uh, they're talking about, I think, 43, 42,000 square kilometers of subduction zones versus uh, 70, well, they double that, 148,000 kilometers of production zones, mm -hmm. uh, if you consider where, where the production on both sides uh, of the ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, why is there so few, uh, so little subduction? But even what bothers me more yet is the fact that uh, s s 44% 40, of these subduction zones, there's no sediment. Uh, uh, where you'd have the sediment, it isn't especially crumpled. Uh, in the Pacific, you know, you're supposed to have all this material going down into the, the subduction zone. You have these gills there, you have the uh, uh, sea mounts, these are these mounds. Nothing of that in those subduction zones. Wh what happened? Why? They should be full of these sea mounts, full of sediments. They aren't there. Uh, to me, this is a, a caution about this whole plate tectonics model that we need to keep in mind. Uh, I, I appreciated your, your suggestion of uh, the third day of creation week. Uh, I, I kind of played a little bit with the idea that well, maybe uh, uh, when God made the continents, this is when our plates developed and when our Olson ridges developed and so on, and that during the flood, uh, what we had was not uh, this movement of the continent since it and so on. Uh, maybe during the flood, the continent sank down then and rose back up. Just another model to think about. I think that's the ICR model that they figure that a lot happened on the third day of creation. So. And I agree, yeah, there's all kinds of limitations to science, that science keeps on changing, and I guess you could say that's both its strength and its weakness, is that it, it keeps on changing. So, yeah, good. Do you have any comments on the, uh, the fountains of the deep opened? The fountains of the deep. Actually, this is kind of what um, uh, Walter Brown develops his model on is the fountains of the deep and so you had water as kind of the lubricant between the the crust and the mantle or whatever he calls it that was that was one of them and he shows the water going up into the atmosphere like I don't know maybe 10 kilometers or five kilometers or whatever and then that's where all the water came from was and that's that was the beginning of the of the plate tectonics so his his model specifically is based on the idea of the fountains of the deep. And sometimes when I give this talk, I, I appreciate John Baumgartner's model a little bit more because I feel like he's a geophysicist and understands the, the geology a little better, at least the geophysics. And some people c come back and say, well, we like Walter Brown's model because it fits in the fountains of the deep. And I don't know that there has been any evidence found for all this subterranean water that Walter Brown is talking about. Now, I may be wrong about that, but I don't know. Um, I haven't heard any suggestions. And I've actually looked at John Baumgartner's model more than Walter Brown's, so. Um, but yeah, at Fountains of the Deep. And actually, that was part of the one on Patmos. Um, did Patmos form when the Fountains of the Deep were broken up? One way of reading the book Acts of the Apostles is that they were formed when the Fountains of the Deep were broken up. But it doesn't fit very well because Patmos is actually pretty close to the top of the geologic columns, so it would be more likely at the end of the flood or after the flood rather than the beginning. So that's another reference to Fountains of the Deep that I've looked at a little bit. Before we go on, I need to point out that uh, it is now 11.30, and I know some of you have places you have to be. Uh, but we'll continue with questions as long as uh, uh, Ben is willing to take them. So go ahead. Thank you. I um, appreciate the <coughs> excuse me the beautiful pictures and, and um, very elegant demonstration of of continental drift tectonic plate movement. Uh, my question is is more of a philosophical one of the relationship between science and faith, and it's this: um, John Bob, Bob Gartner is obviously a um, a, a man of great integrity and uh, 
his calculations show that in order for his theory to actually have functioned, you would need a, um, a 10 to the ninth, um, nine orders of magnitude change in, in several different things. Uh, viscosity, you need nine orders of magnitude increase in, in uh, heat flow, um, all of which are and he well, puts in radiometric dating as nine orders of magnitude. As nine orders of magnitude, too. Well, yeah. well, nine orders of magnitude is a lot. And for those of us that earn our living as scientists, um, we would normally simply discard any solution that required a nine order of magnitude change and say it is impossible. It's as close to impossible as science can ever get. And, well, I suppose you could get 500 orders of magnitude or something like that. But by the time you get to nine, for practical purposes, it's impossible. At what point, yet we, we insist, for instance, that when science supports what we believe to be true, um, that it be within one or two orders of magnitude, preferably half an order of magnitude or a quarter of an order of magnitude. In astronomy, they, don't, they say if it's within an order of magnitude, it's pretty good. Okay, astronomy, <laughs> but we're dealing there with hundreds of millions of light yeah. years and yeah. whatever, the yeah. very, very large numbers. Yeah. But on Earth, in biology or in physics, um, you would not publish a paper saying this is the explanation of that unless you were within half an order of magnitude or a quarter or something of that sort. At what point in the scale between this half or quarter, uh, preferably you'd like to be right on so you're not, even, um, you're not even off by a factor of one or two, much less an order of magnitude. At what point in this scale um, are we playing fast and loose with scientific explanations if we'll look at something that's nine orders of magnitude out and say, well, it's an interesting idea? Because we don't do that normally in, in science. Um, I think the one with the viscosity, you have nine orders of magnitude in the viscosity, but it's in an exponential relationship to temperature. And so in that case, he says, well, you only have to increase the temperature by 300 degrees to get the viscosity to decrease by nine orders of magnitude. So that may not be necessarily quite as much of an issue. I think there's still some difficulties to it. Nine orders of magnitude is still a lot. It is, but, um, but you do have quite a bit of variation in the viscosity anyway. You, you do have several orders of variation in the viscosity. So that, that's not as much of an issue, but I think that, that your point would probably be better related to the heat flow and the change in decay rates. And this, this talk wasn't about change in decay rates, but John Baumgartner has addressed that, and they, they changed that by nine orders. It's in order to get these stripes, um, because you, you're, got, you're out two, three hundred million years on the outside and right. a couple of hundred thousand on the inside. That's right, yeah. Um, so he invokes, and probably a lot of the people at Institute for Creation Research invoke major changes in fundamental laws. Now, I think Gould has written a paper where he talks about uniformitarianism, and he has four parts, uniformitarianism in rates, processes, or sorry, laws, processes, conditions, and rates. Um, and all four of those, apparently Hutton and Lyell were comfortable with, that they were all uniform. Today, I think geologists are willing to accept that conditions may have changed and rates may have changed, but they feel like probably the laws haven't changed and the processes today are probably the same as the ones in the past. Okay, the ICR people would say everything has changed, even the laws have changed. And I guess I would not necessarily be against that, but I would say that then maybe you're kind of moving out of the realm of science. You're saying, well, God, steps in and, and does in, it. Into the realm of miracle. Right, yeah, ba basically. And I would say that if you invoke that for change in decay rates and getting rid of the heat fast, you're invoking a miracle. And then, I'm not sure how you go about studying that scientifically. Well, that was going to be my next and, question. And uh, that, that's tricky. Um, and, and it just, you know, once you invoke one change, then you have to invoke some more. So with radiometric dating, if you speed up the decay rates, then you're going to heat, it, heat things up a lot faster. And so then maybe you have to invoke another miracle to get rid of all that heat from the decay. 
And you also have so much radiation that you're going to kill the animals and the people, and so you have to invoke another miracle so it doesn't kill people or something. I don't know. I, I haven't really seen people put all the pieces together, so I don't know quite, quite how you'd put it together. But, but at that point, um, we're no longer doing science, so would yeah, we not be better so. off just simply saying, we don't understand it, we yeah. can't reproduce it, we can't even study it, we believe God did it. Yeah. Now, as far as heat flow, this is one of the things I'm working on now. I'm, I'm setting up some software to do heat flow modeling calculations. Uh, the people I'm working with have done it for the Sierras, especially the Yosemite area. So there are heat flow equations, and you can develop that. Um, and cooling down of smaller bodies, like let's say the Sierra Nevadas or even something like Mount San Jacinto, which is a big, great big granite body. It doesn't necessarily take millions of years. You can do a simple calculation, and maybe it would take, you know, 50, 60,000 years for something that size to cool down. And I suppose if you include water moving through it, maybe it could even be faster, although if, you, if water's moving through it, you should see evidence for the water in the cracks. Crystal size should change. There, there should be a lot of things that you could tell whether the heat had, whether the heat had been transported more rapidly. Um, but that doesn't fit it in one year. And so that's one of the issues. If you have fossils, then you have magma, granite, and then you have more fossils, and you say that these fossils here and these fossils here were all deposited in the flood, and then you have magma in between, you kind of need the magma to cool down in a year as well. And that's the kind of thing you have south of Corona, is fossils, fossils, and then this Southern California batholith in between. And there may be ways to get around it. I, you know, I'm sure there's possibilities, but it... It, it gets complicated once you, what do they say, the devil's in the details. So once you look at the details, it's not quite clear how you get it all to work. Ed. The, uh, the last plague, if I'm not mistaken, is a great earthquake. If you take that, when Christ comes, every eye shall see him, you know, an earthquake that large you know, could that be possibly the cause of bringing all the continents back together, as you saw, you know, with about that speed? That's, I mean, a, that's a neat idea. Everything is basically destroyed. You know, people are still alive. Mm -hmm. But it's miraculous, to be sure. It's not a scientific Yeah, thing. yeah, for sure. I, I, that's, I hadn't heard anybody suggest that, but that's pretty interesting, yeah. I mean, that seems like it would solve a couple of problems yeah, at once. Maybe so, yeah. Good. Well, I'll, I'll have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the interesting signs I saw in a geologist's door was this kind of political-looking uh, comment, and it said, reunite Gondwana uh, land. <laughs> I think probably there needs to be some reuniting. Yeah. Uh, we are all more comfortable, at least some of us, are more comfortable with empirical data than the miraculous. Uh, but we run into a stone wall because of the empirical data. Uh, for instance, the probability of life could arise by itself for, you know, one times ten to the five a thousandth, uh, five millionth, sorry, mm -hmm. power. I mean, and, and scientists live with this. Uh, some say, well, no, uh, 10 to the minus 50, that's, beyond that, that's impossible, uh, and so on. Uh, but I, I think when I look at the total picture, I'm more or less forced into saying, no, my science does not answer what I see. Yeah. And, uh, therefore, I'm not going to draw my worldview on the basis of just my science because it doesn't work for everything. True, yeah. it works for a lot of things. Uh, it doesn't work for everything. And uh, I do that uh, rationally. And once I've done that, then, you know, I, I can say, well, uh, if there is a God, and it seems to be, my science says there's got to be some God who can put this life together. That this, uh, if there is a God, uh, he would communicate with us. Uh, I mean, if, he, if there's a creator, 
we are part of that creation. Uh, you could possibly different models, you know, but it seems like he'd be involved in our creation. That he would communicate with us somewhere or other to make us uh, beings with vocabulary and communicating. Uh, it seems reasonable to think he would, and and so I turned to the Bible. And so I, I I have a better package, I think, than to just try and say no. I'm going to answer everything. I'm going to be a scientist here, and I'm going to answer everything with science. I, you know, we like to go down that route uh, because we're more secure of empirical knowledge, but it doesn't work, and so. I feel the reasonable thing is, no, well, the best package is, you know, take the Bible, put it together. Uh, what did God do on the third day? I mean, how were these continents formed? Because, you know, that's when land was separated from the, from the waters, and you said, well, maybe uh, the earth was all covered with water. We weren't there, we don't know for sure, uh, before that. Uh, but uh, some of these things that uh, we see here in, in this plate tectonics model, uh, may relate very much to what God might have done on the third day, and uh, uh, I think we need to put these packages together. Uh, the broader our approach, the more likely we're to find truth. Yeah, oh definitely. Looking at all the different pieces, how do you fit them all together? I'm not, I know basically nothing about biology, but the little bit I had in high school, I would say that um, the complexity I see in life I don't see any way you can get that from pure chance. So, yeah, definitely. I may have missed uh, the explanation in uh, John Baumgartner's model. Uh, wh where did all the energy come from that heats? The Sorry, mass? I didn't. I didn't include that. Um, when he first developed the model, I think that he suggested it came from a meteorite impact in Pangaea. And that's, that's what started it moving. I think since then, he's worked with other people, and they suggest we don't know where it came from. Meteor impact could be one, but they think maybe there's others as well, miraculous and, and so forth. So, well, could, yeah, good question. Um, Michael Ord proposes a glacial ice age following the deluge, if I'm not mistaken. He does, he does have, yeah. In which case, his model suggests that things are warming and John Baumgartner's model things must need to cool and cool rapidly. There, there seems to be a big disconnect there. I think in Michael Ord's model he says that during the flood the oceans were warm which meant that after the flood you had lots of evaporation so you get lots of, of uh, water up in the air and then it all rained or snowed, and that's what caused the ice age, was I guess that um, you had lots of volcanism, and so you had a reverse greenhouse effect, and so the air was cool, and so, so you got the glaciers afterwards. I don't know that that would necessarily be contrary to Baumgartner's model. I think he'd say that it was hot. You know, it could be hot oceans during the flood. And then he says, well, somehow you get rid of the heat real fast. And he, he figures that God did it miraculously. And so on that point, I'm not sure they disagree. But they do disagree. Ord and Baumgartner do disagree about whether there's plate tectonics or not. So, or at least they did nine years ago when they wrote that article. Um, you mentioned that uh, your area of research is uh, granitic. Uh, formation, and that um, the area you're studying, you've got fossils above and below granites, which um, have certain cooling rates that we can, we can just like we can measure decay rates, we can measure cooling rates and crystalline structure. The crystalline structure of the granites, as I understand it, crystals get bigger and bigger as the cooling is slower and slower. Do you know of any way in which you can get the sorts of crystals you see in the in the granites up and down California, or the ones you're studying, in less than several hundred thousand years of cooling? Um, it, the, the, the general way, and when I teach igneous and metamorphic petrology, um, we talk about granites, or granitic kind of rocks versus volcanic rocks. And granitic, granites cool 
more slowly, and there's time for crystals to form, whereas volcanic rocks, you have the magma coming out in the surface, and, the, and um, so they cool rapidly, and in general, you don't have crystals. You may have crystals that were formed slowly down deep that come up with the magmas, and you'll get some crystals, but it's not a interlocking crystal matrix. Um, so in general, that seems to be the case. However, you can get more rapid large crystal growth if you have um, uh, maybe three, four, five percent water in the magma. And in that case, and then you get stuff like pegmatites. And Southern California is known for its pegmatites. There's spectacular pegmatites between here and, and San Diego. Um, some are famous for um, lithium micas, lepidolite, and they mine these to get lithium out that they use in prescription drugs and so forth. And one place... And batteries. And batteries, yes, of course. Um, there is one place right near Hemet, near Nuevo, um, that I would take students to, but now the person who's teaching mineralogy takes students there. A, a big pegmatite that has great big crystals. Um, size? Pardon? Size? The tourmaline, some of the tourmaline is like this big around. And it's hard to tell how long it is because you can only see the end of it. But it's, it may be, you know, a foot long or something like that. Um, and they probably formed fairly rapidly. A time frame, I don't know, but maybe years or months or something like that. But in these, what happens is, as the magma cools, you get all your basic elements going into the little minerals, um, like cornblende and biotite. Um, and then all the junk stuff, the, the, all the elements that are left over, um, are in the last magma to cool. And often this last magma is high in water content, and then it'll get intruded into cracks. And so you have dikes and sills and these pegmatites. And so that's what we have in the Lakeview Mountains. It's right, right close to Winchester. Um, Winchester's on south of it, Nuevo is kind of northwest of it and so forth. And th there's other places too, but this is where I take students. Um, and so with all the water in there, the water can make the elements move a little bit more rapidly. So you can get large crystals if you have a lot of water to, to carry them within the magma. Um, time frames, it depends on a lot of stuff. And I don't, um, in one year, you might be able to get some of that for, for the dikes and sills and pegmatites. For the large crystal bodies, they probably would not figure that those you could get in one year. You, you don't necessarily need millions of years, but you'd probably... Hundreds of thousands? Um, maybe even thou thousands, maybe, some, something like that. So, or tens of thousands, but um, probably not necessarily even hundreds of thousands. I'll okay. ask a couple of my own. Um, okay. Uh, in North America, there, there are two major sets of mountains. There's the mountains in California, with first the minor coastal range and then the Sierra Nevadas, which of course contains the highest mountain in the uh, continental, well, the coterminous United States anyway. Much to the unhappiness of the Coloradans. Uh, Coloradans, yeah, who have the next five or six. And that's the interesting thing, is you have the Rockies on, on the one side, and then the uh, Sierra Nevadas on the other, and the basin in between. Are you aware of, I, I had read somewhere that, there, that they had done some uh, sonic analysis that suggested that there was a slab that went all the way underneath the Sierra Nevadas and uh, over to the Rockies before it finally dived uh, down under the continent. Uh, have you seen that? That seems to be the standard interpretation for the Rockies. They, they call it flat slab subduction. Instead of it going down like this, it goes and then it goes flat. And it went as far as Colorado, Denver, and then that's where it did. That, that's the theory, anyway. And, and, and the question that I have is, how do you maintain the structural integrity of that kind of a slab to where it can maintain force enough to push the, Col the Colorado Rockies up, uh, what, a thousand miles away from where it's being subducted? Actually, the structural in integrity of the plates is a significant one for other areas, too. Can you get the spreading centers push pushing up 
and structural integrity of entire plate that the entire plate gets pushed or the subduction on the other end pulled. And so that's the reason they're a little bit leery about saying, well, it's just a push-pull. They say, well, maybe there's some convection too. It's the mantle that's moving as well. So it's, it's a combination of a bunch in the current theory. But the flat slab subduction, they're still, they're still talking about that. And, and North America isn't the only place. There's two places in South America where they have interpreted flat slab subduction too. One is right through the middle of Peru, where I'm working. Another one is the north end of Chile, where you seem to have flat slab subduction for maybe, I don't know, 500 kilometers in maybe. So instead of it dipping down and you have a bunch of volcanoes, it goes in. So there's a place where you don't have the volcanoes. So, and that's true in Peru. There's a stretch there where you don't have nearly as many volcanoes. It's more just granites. Down the south end of Peru, you have volcanoes. The north end, you do. But in the middle, you don't have quite as much volcanic activity. So they say, well, it's flat slab subduction there. I was just thinking that if, if, if things are moving a little more rapidly, it might be easier to see how the plate uh, that's being subducted can maintain its structural integrity enough to force the Colorado Rockies up. Especially if you have lower viscosity. Then, yeah. then you wouldn't have so much you'd have to push again. So. Yeah. Now the other question that I had um, on uh, plate uh, uh, tectonics had to do with uh, uh, I think I lost it, and so I'm going to let, turn it over <laughs> to somebody else. That's what happens when I stand up here and people ask me three or four questions. Usually I can't remember the whole series of them. <laughs> it seems to me that uh, <coughs> excuse me, I <coughs> I was traveling with you in, in 2006, and you showed us <coughs> what at the time you said was the edge of the, um, uh, was it the flat slab? You showed us the edge of something which you said was responsible for the plate that was pushing up the Rockies. Um, well, what was that? I'm not sure I know exactly what you're talking about. I'll mention one thing, and you can tell me whether I'm right or not. As we went west out of Denver, by, by Silverthorne, there's a place where there's a thrust fault. And you could see the young, I think it's Cretaceous Pierre Shale, I don't remember for sure, but I think it was the Pierre Shale that was underneath Precambrian. And so you could see a thrust fault there um, where one was moving underneath the other. I don't know whether that was. That I had the impression that this was the, the uh, Pacific Plate and that we could somehow see the the edge of the Pacific Plate underneath the, oh. the Rockies? Um, now, the, you do have the Rio Grande Rift. Uh, you, you have the effect of the Pacific Plate. A according to the standard theory, you have the effect of the Pacific Plate that goes, well, technically, it's not even the Pacific Plate. It's the Farallon Plate, okay. Farallon but, plate. but whatever. The, you have the effect of the Farallon Plate is about as far as Denver. And then um, it drops off. And they've been doing a bunch of seismic stuff. And I can't keep up with all this stuff. But they do the deep, deep seismic. And they can estimate how thick the um, lithosphere is. And whether this lithosphere, some of it actually drops off. And so in the Sierras, in the last 10, 20 years, they talk about delamination, that, that you get the slab subducted, and then it breaks off and falls down into the mantle. And so you get different kind of volcanism in the Sierras um, in the Pliocene than you do in the Pleistocene because this slab has dropped off. Now, in Colorado, you have the Rio Grande Rift. And in some place, and it's kind of rotated. In some places, you get thrust faulting up north around Denver. But further south, you get um, spreading. Um, down near Taos and Albuquerque and so forth. And that's where you get the Rio Grande Rift. So you get, um, you get this rotation. At least the forces indicate that. The reason for it, I don't know how they tie that into um, the Farallon plate. But then, but then you have another thing. There's all kinds of stuff happening here. Um, you also have spreading. In, in addition to the pushing, a lot of the recent stuff in Nevada and Utah, the Basin and Range Province, you actually have extension where it's being pulled apart. And as it's pulled apart, then you have um, fault block mountains. 
where they fall down like this. As it's pulled apart, they have to fall down. So as you drive west to east across Nevada, you get a range and then a valley, and then a range and then a valley. And that's because these mountains have dropped down in an extensional regime. So in addition to the compression, it's, it's pretty complicated. And I actually, I skipped that picture. We, I, I had one here on basin and range, and I thought, that's too complicated. I'll just skip that. So, so yeah, a lot's happening there. I, I remember the, the question that I had was, okay. uh, uh, I read once uh, where Baumgartner suggested that uh, there was evidence that parts of the mantle were cool and other parts were hot. Mm -hmm. And he raised the question of how they would be that way if this were a very slow, gradual process that you would expect the heat to have transferred by now. And uh, he was arguing for a, a rapid event in the past because of the, because of the cooler parts of the mantle. I don't know, have you seen that and do you have the, any comments it, on In that? the standard framework, they do suggest that when a plate is subducted, pieces of it will break off, delamination. And, and these pieces of the oceanic crust break off, they go down to the bottom of the mantle at the core mantle boundary, and then as part of this convection, those pieces um, that are enriched, they're, they're different composition than um, the mantle is, but they're down there in the mantle, and then they come back up to the surface. And they're, the reason for them interpreting it this way is because of the geochemical composition of mantle plumes, like what you get at, in Hawaii. And the composition there just does not make sense because it's not, a mant it's not your normal mantle composition. It's an enriched composition, and they have to figure out why does it get enriched, because normally the mantle would get depleted when the crust is formed. And so you have these, uh, according to the theory, you have these oceanic crustal pieces that are down in the mantle, and I think that's probably what John Baumgartner is referring to, is these crustal pieces in the mantle that are cooler than the rest of the mantle. And that's part of the standard theory, but as far as how do they maintain their integrity? Um, that might be a problem. I'd have to look at that some more. But I think in the standard model, they say that they maintain their integrity for some time, but then eventually they get incorporated into these hot spots, into the mantle plume. So, but I, that, that was a useful question to look at. I think the that he had was, uh, was how fast the heat transfer That's was. True. And if you're talking millions of years versus uh, yeah you know, thousands, that there's a difference in how fast uh, it would get rid of heat. And I that's true, yeah. So, so yeah, and, and that's another issue with heat flow. If you have the heat flow real fast to get rid of the heat from the oceanic crust, would you have real fast heat flow from these pieces that fell off as well? And, you know, and, and the, the more you look at the details, the more complicated it gets and the less you can say. At least for me, it seems like, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't really know. Yeah, it's probably been 150 years that young Earth creationists have wrestled with issues about things moving, the crust moving, and things out of place. For example, uh, it was discovered early on that in Spitsbergen, way up north toward the Arctic, above the Arctic Circle, you had fossils of plants that love a warm climate. When that became published and known as a fact, I came across a book of one creationist, young earth, 6,000 year creationist, who suggested that before the flood, the earth's magnetic field was tipped way out of order, and parts of the earth, the crust part with life on it, uh, kind of levitated or something happened and it just rode hundreds and thousands of miles out of place. Hmm. No one ever pays any attention to that book. I think it was the 1860s. I don't even remember the name of the author. I think it was called The Dynamic Earth. So he had some kind of crust moving on the interior of the Earth? Yeah. Right? And, the and there was maybe a the decoupling between the interior and the Yeah, surface, right. Or? Decoupled, and the energy source would have been huge magnetic pulses. Hmm probably as a result of sin and, mm -hmm. and you know. I think <laughs> Russ Humphreys has some kind of 
rapid magnetic pulses right at the beginning of the flood. Oh. And I, th I think I've seen a plot where it goes like this, and then after a while it kind of... And so this, this rapid fluctuation, yeah. he has this, the um, magnetic field reversals that give the, oh. ocean, or, the ocean floor um, zebra stripes. Yeah. But, but then after a while it, it damps out. But it doesn't seem like you'd have a lot of energy generated out of a magnetic field that you could do that. So I don't know no, much don't about magnetism. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't think they have the magnetic field all figured out at this <laughs> point. So. Then bringing it up to date, I think Baumgartner and Humphrey and some of the others, and um, Brown, Walter Brown, um, once you say that most of the fossils are produced during the flood, then you're locked into a short time frame. Yeah, yeah, there I is a trend so. now, uh, in the last two years in the Creation Research Society Quarterly, that uh, you have some authors suggesting that the dinosaurs lived and even died out before the flood. And there's a Joel Klink, is his name. In, He's in a, CRSQ or? Yeah, CRSQ, which is really? kind of really surprising. So the now, dinosaurs if died out before the before flood. the flood, so maybe a the flood few died in the flood, or? but most of them died out before the flood. Hmm. And he uses biblical reasons for it, exegetical. Now, if you say that Paleozoic Mesozoic is before the flood, then you have to rethink this whole thing of continental drift and how you that's true what the energy source is and. I'm wondering if radioactive decay, rapid decay, would provide enough energy to get things um, moving. Anyway, that's the, just my question. Yeah, Radioactive decay would provide heat, and I guess, according to John Baumgartner, if you raise the heat by 300 degrees, it would lower the viscosity by nine orders of magnitude. So maybe he ties them all together somehow. I'd, um, I thought what you were gonna, about to say was that Walter Brown and John Baumgartner had gotten together and they were working on a model together. I hadn't heard of that, no. but not, not that. Oh, okay. But some, some folk are thinking it's the fall of mankind is when God changed the laws. I don't okay. agree to that. I know that there's a, the ent they, some people suggest that's when entropy started. Yeah. At, at but uh, yeah, there are, creationists who think that uh, the curse upon Adam and Eve involved all kinds of things in the geophysical world. Yeah, yeah. Maybe including continental drift starting and all kinds of problems. Yeah, maybe. And meteorite impacts happening right after the fall, before the flood. Mm -hmm. So a lot, of, a lot of this is being stretched out over at least 2,000 years. I don't know that 2,000 years helps our problem I'm much. not sure. I know there's evidence for meteorite impacts in the Precambrian, so yeah. I don't know quite how one deals with that. What, probably the, at least for me, the most famous one is the Verita Fort crater, right. and, and just yeah. south of Johannesburg. And if you go to the Johannesburg airport and wander around and see all the columns there, you can see the results of that meteorite impact where they have um, quarried the granites and put them there in the columns in the airport, and you can see all the cracks mm. there where they have rapidly melted due to the impact and then frozen up in the cracks. Mm. And that is, I don't remember the age of it, it's supposed to be 2.5 billion years or something yeah. like that. But there's pretty good evidence for a, for a meteor impact there. Let's and there's evidence in the Paleozoic where it's hit yeah. into limestone and it leaves these um, shatter cones, they're called, and then you have maybe Mesozoic or Cenozoic sediments on top of the impact zone. So and you have shock quartz and so quartz. that's another thing you have to put in the equation along with continental drift. I think. Yeah. Maybe well, there is a consistent picture it's, that we'll It's like develop. Dr. Roth was saying. You have to include all the different pieces the together in trying trying to develop yeah. a model. You, so yeah, good. E, at the beginning of your talk, you you promised us that you would explain how continental drift uh, accounted for the continents, and I'm sure you did it, but I missed it, so. No, I, I went too fast. There was a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff I did. How, how did we get the continents, and how did continental drift produce them for us? Um, according to the standard model, um, well, I guess independent of the standard model, 
the, the continents have a granitic, are mostly a granitic kind of composition, whereas the ocean floors are mostly a basaltic kind of composition. Granite has a density, a specific gravity of something like 2.7. Basalt is more like 3.3. And so the continents have a lower density. The oceans have a higher density. Okay, the continents that are mostly granite are mostly Precambrian. The, the cores, the basement of, of all the continents is pretty much Precambrian. On the top, you get more recent stuff. And you can see this Precambrian, a lot of Australia is that way, probably about half of Africa is that way, the Canadian Shield is that way. Okay, so how did it form? Um, in the standard model, what happens is you start getting plate tectonics um, at about 3.5, 3.4 billion years. And so at that point, the interior of the Earth is hot enough that you're starting to get these convection cells in the mantle. And in the places where the mantle is uh, welling up, um, you're going to start to get volcanics, um, volcanic arcs, a, a string of volcanoes. And what comes out of those volcanoes is less dense stuff. The more dense stuff is heavier, so it sinks down. It's your ultramafic and, and some of the mafic, whereas the less dense stuff comes out and it's more intermediate or felsic, which is, it's higher in silica, so it, it has a lower density. And so the volcanics um, that you started getting in South Africa and many other places were less dense, and so they would float higher in the mantle. Uh, the mantle can be thought of as liquid or at least plastic, and so the crust floats on the mantle. And so if you have part of the crust, like the continents, it's less dense, it's going to float higher. If you have stuff like the oceanic floor that's more dense, it floats lower. And so that's the reason the ocean basins are low, and they're filled with water, and the continents are high, and they, they float higher. Let me see if I follow you. The <laughs> There's a bunch of pieces to it. I'm trying to explain a okay, the an stuff hour lecture in three minutes. So. The stuff comes up. Um, and it's a, a, um, a uniform mixture of the, of the uh, mantle. <coughs> it, well, it, it's it not, actually. What happens is the mantle, you only have partial melting of the mantle. The part that melts is less dense, and it comes to the surface. The part that doesn't melt stays behind, and it's the more dense stuff. Oh, I thought what you were saying was that it comes up, gets transported across the surface, dives under, and in the process of diving under, the lighter portions are recycled back to the top with the volcanoes. There, yeah, there's that. Yes. There's that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. I got it. There's Bowen's reaction series. That's right. Yes. So that's, that's, that's part of the picture. Yeah. Good. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces to it. I, I, don't, know, <laughs> I, I don't know whether you want a half hour description or a three minute description. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm happy to quit. One more, and then I, okay. I will call it a day. Go ahead. Yes. I had two questions, but uh, okay. you were speaking. In one of the quotes was talking about worry is blind and knows not the future, but our heavenly Father's a thousand ways of which we know not. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Along that same line, she says that all of the stuff that was going to take place in the future, God had planned for in the past and had made it ready. So like Cora Dathan, you know, that was mm. something that was the, the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, could have been prevented, you know, or gone either way, depending on how the people reacted. And the waters that were put in the earth before the flood, you know, which is partly where they came from, to flood the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a part where you have to go on faith of what is written as opposed to trying to reason it out and tease it apart. That was part of it. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts as a physicist on the uh, God particle. Oh. The Bozeman Hicks. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to take it a different direction. I was going to say, well, that's what happened when Job couldn't figure out why he was suffering. And so... Um, here God comes down and doesn't even bother to explain about the suffering. He starts talking about the earth. And he doesn't even explain about the earth. He just asks Job a bunch of questions and, 
And Job ended up with more questions than he started off with, but he seemed satisfied anyway. So, you know, this is a book that's written by Moses describing the situation with Job. So it's kind of a first-hand perspective, apparently, of what took place, and we'll know a lot more when we get there. But it, yeah. it opens a great controversy in a way we wouldn't have so early. To tell the you Bible. the truth, I haven't been looking at the God particle these last couple days, but I think they just had a big announcement on Thursday or Wednesday about the Higgs boson. And I, I knew it was coming, but I've been so busy with this, um, trying to get the stuff set up on my computer, I haven't looked at it. What's, this, my, what's this supposed to prove? or? Oh, I think it's supposed to be related to where does mass come from? Why do particles have mass instead of no mass? And so it's pretty important. And when my son-in-law comes this next Thursday, I'm going to have to know about it because he's an astrophysicist and he's going to tell me about it. So, or maybe I'll just wait till he comes and he'll he'll tell me what it is. So, but yeah, that's a. So does any? What did they say? Does anybody know what they said here Wednesday or Thursday? They know a little more where to go. Oh, okay. Do they there know what the mass there, is supposed to be? No. Oh, okay. but, well, uh, 125 um, yeah, I, yeah. a million electron volts. Um, I was listening to a particle physicist lecture about three weeks ago, <clears throat> and he was asked why is it called the God particle, and he said, um, if you just called it the Jones particle, you couldn't get several hundred million dollars in grants. That's if right. it's the God particle, you can. <laughs> That's probably a good answer. <laughs>